All right. I'll talk today about the evolution of optimistic rollup proofs. I'm uh, Proto, engineer at OP Labs. Disclaimer, this is all very, very experimental stuff. I'll go over it slowly and in, in, like, give away the alpha, or, like how these things work. But these things are not live on mainnet yet. So I'll talk about optimistic fault proofs, how these things work, just give you the, the, record, the introduction to get everybody started. Now I'll talk about proof diversity. This is this layer two equivalent of the client diversity problem on layer one. Then we have some history, architecture, and then the components in these systems, how they change. So about optimistic fault proofs, I use fault proof rather than fault proof because the system can fault too. It's not just actors trying to insert malicious data. The system as a whole needs to be secure. Now, the main property that differentiates these proofs from ZK proofs is that there's a one week dispute period. This one week dispute period um, creates a delay for withdrawals, not for deposits. People can onboard very quickly. It's the withdrawal system that requires a bridge from layer two back to layer one that introduces this, uh, this fault proof uh, game. It's interactive. There are non-interactive versions. So the software and rollups and in other alternative ecosystems like Celestia, Tesos, and so on, use non-interactive uh, proofs. And the difference here is that you can verify computation by repeating all of it, or you can try and minimize the work, which is great for on-chain use cases like on Ethereum. And so it enables you to do a smaller on-chain proof if you do it interactively. So just to get aligned on who participates in this rollup. People often confuse these actors, and many of the rollups today on mainnet basically combine these. They are one and the same to the end user. But in, in the operations, they are very different. They have their own keys, they have their own isolated security, like risk services. It's the sequencer who builds the blocks, we have the batch emitter who then publishes the data. We have the verifier who replicates the chain. And then we have the output proposer, which could be the sequencer or any other verifier, that then takes the layer two chain. And once it has verified that the inputs are available on layer one, and so everybody can reproduce it, then it can make a claim of what the output is supposed to be, post that to layer one. And then the proofing system ensures that the output holds. And so with um, optimistic proofs, you have this challenge mechanism to have anybody who has the layer two state post a challenge to the layer one whenever the previously claimed output does not match their view of the layer two chain. And then it's up to the on-chain proof to resolve if the challenger or the original claim speaks the truth. And the nice thing about this, these last two actors is that you can generalize this a lot. So the output proposer can be any type of claiming system about the layer two. It doesn't just have to be a state root. It can be any type of property about the layer two. And the challenger can become um, this open permissionless system where anybody can play this interactive game to gain this, this layer two kind of MAV, where you get rewarded for disproving um, dishonest claims. And so it's these last two actors that are actively changing in layer two. The other actors, they're already highly optimized. They can decentralize further, but since rollups already have censorship resistance, you get the most value from first improving the last two actors. And so what are we proving? Well, what we're trying to prove is this 
state transition, this process of looking at layer one data and then turning it into layer two state. And these state changes, they are basically derived, they start with raw data on layer one. This raw data combined with receipts of deposits or other events then get turned into inputs. These inputs are prepared by the layer two consensus layer and then the layer two execution layer processes them. This is the EVM, OPGAF. This is the, the equivalent of what we see on layer one, except all the inputs are derived from a data availability layer on layer one, rather than more dynamically and through consensus Layer two really only has one consensus rule, and that is follow the layer one canonical chain. So what are these things going through the state transition? We have some agreed pre-state, we have witness data, and then we have the disputed post-state. It's the pre-state that's already confirmed in previous claims on layer one. And so if you disagree with the pre-state as well, you would challenge a previous claim rather than challenging the latest claim. And then once you have this agreed upon pre-state, it's just a matter of adding the, the diff, the, the delta to the next state on top and processing it to conclude what the next post-state is. And it's up to the proof to verify that this witness data and this pre-state actually becomes this post state through computation. And so really it's just a pure function that you're trying to prove of these two different inputs. And then a pure function creates a single trace of execution. And you can put this trace in a tree. So from step, steps 16 to 31 in this slide, the bottom layer, you can outline instructions. You can basically prepare small state changes. And then through bisection, you can determine where things start to differ between the, the claim and the challenger. Now, how do we secure the system? Well, we can start with a single proof. But with a single proof, you only get so far, you risk that you cannot remove the training wheels because of this smart contract type risk, where if there's a bug, the whole system fails. And so to solve this, you need a quorum of solutions. You need a guarantee that if one component has a problem, the whole thing stays secure. Now in the like short term, layer twos are adding councils or like human actors to this, this multi-proof, this combination of an on-chain proof and other actors. But in the future, where we want to go is to remove the humans from the equation, make it a very like fair system where there's no doubt about the outputs. And to do so, you need to create alternative clients. And by creating these alternative clients, you can remove or you can make one of the clients fail, you'll see that the system just continues working and there's no risk of any uh, assets going away or like being hacked somehow, where the system still supported with the, the alternative clients. And so this is great for resilience in terms of uptime, but also in these on-chain proofs that secure the layer two state. This is the state of layer one client diversity. We're getting there. So increasingly we see more clients pop up. This picture can still look a lot better. And with layer two right now, we're in a very similar state where every rollup has one proof. And I think this is a bad start. Like we want to be in a place where there are multiple clients securing the system. And so how could this look like? Well, potentially, and it's very experimental, we can combine different components to create a quorum, to have a, a proof of one virtual machine and another virtual machine 
And then if they agree, you allow the system to continue operating. If they disagree, you might pick the majority or you might just halt the system to, pre to prefer safety over liveness. And so in this example, we take the OP node and OP gov from the OP stack and we combine them into a program that can be fault proven. But then we have a potential Rust equivalent that can, pre can be proven by the same technology. And then you have more options on chain and thus more robustness. And well, how do you create more clients? It all starts with licensing that needs to be open. It starts with specifications that need to be clear on what the standard is that client implementations are supposed to conform with. With layer one, this is already set and established with an EIP process. We have execution and consensus specifications. With layer two, we're starting to get there. The OP stack does have a specification and we're building alternative proofs. The community is building alternative proofs to make this, this an ecosystem rather than a singular reference implementation. I'll go into a little bit of history for fun. This is, after all, not just technological improvements, but also just a long story of Ethereum skating. Now, this is the pre-2020 history. Apologies if I leave out your layer two or your big event. This is a summary. It starts with this legendary post from Vitalik about shadow chains. And shadow chains are like chains that, you know, they're kind of like roll-ups, but the proofing thing wasn't quite figured out yet. Then we have Truebit introducing multi-round verification. We have Arbitrum uh, in, like introducing or reiterating the trace bisection. And then we have this idea of the roll-up term, roll-up with an underscore, this project from uh, Barry Whitehead. And then, well, the, you have this snowball that starts rolling where you have lots of layer twos that start to pop up and try to create roll-ups, provide the skating. Because at this time, it starts to become real where Ethereum gains adoption and we need alternative execution with increased gas limits and new features. And EWASM or like these on-chain layer one execution efforts weren't quite there. And so rollups become a, a thing to scale the community, scale the execution of Ethereum. And then, well, we have Optimism, Arbitrum starting to get to production. Since this talk is about optimistic rollups, I'll just talk about optimistic rollups. But there are ZK rollups in this story too. And then, well, they kind of did rush to production. They did soft launches. They tried to experiment with proofs. And then we have iterate and iterate and iterate. And now we're starting to get to a point where proofs get to mainnet, except that they're still kind of monolithic or they're not like the first. And to really remove the training wheels, I would argue that we need some diversity in the system, need robustness, not depend on one code base. And so, well, how does it look like for the OP stack? This was the original canon. You have this interactive component and then the, the part that, that runs the thing, that executes. And then there's this binary, this definition of the game that people are playing, like this idea of layer two, where you have some state transition that's expressed and then some layer one VM, some prover that executes it and replicates the, the thing. And then Challenger is supposed to, to provide the inputs to get to the, the final uh, part of the game. Now, in the spirit of GeoHot, <laughs> with the images in the uh, repository of Canon, he was adding these, these things to illustrate how Canon was evolving. Started to get more and more advanced. And so now we have a MIPS VM that can prove the binary, but then how about the diversity? Well, we want a RISC-V VM, we want WASM, we want everything. And 
the more options, the better. And if you think of this as a gaming console, when you start to look at the next generation of gaming consoles, things have improved overall. And then the Zika Proofer is kind of this non-interactive version where it just runs. It just, uh, how to put it, it does the execution, it requires some more resources, and it's not as interactive. And then the idea of the game store is that, hey, well, if we have these generic proofing VMs, something not as the ZK EVM, where it's like very specific to what you're trying to prove, well, maybe we can prove more things. Maybe we can open it up and allow community to supply the programs, supply the definitions of what we're trying to prove, and then have it be more of a, like a system where users can, can pick what to play. Like the most <laughs> popular games are cross-platform. We want like this, this optionality in proofing for security, as well as optionality in what we're trying to prove for users to build new creative things. So how do we enable this? Like we, we talked about licensing, we talked about community, but then there's the technical part about the architecture. We need to create interfaces to support people implementing part of the system without requiring all the domain knowledge of every single component. So this is what it looks like in the developed branch of the Optimism monorepo. This is quite experimental. We have this idea of separating the client and the server, where, well, you can think of a, this execution trace at the bottom. And it starts with a prologue. You want to identify the dispute. And if some derivation, you compute the layer two. There's some epilogue, some part where you extract the state. And then how do you get the data? Well, you need to interface through this oracle. We call it the pre-image oracle. And this essentially separates the part that's about the, the on-chain and about the off-chain proofing component. The, the upper part, the server, does not run on-chain. This is merely a system that prepares inputs. So it can interact with the layer one RPC and the layer two RPC to gather the data you need to reconstruct the, the state trace. And so the client ends up executing in MIPS, the server in x86, but you can insert this thing in between. So you don't need a virtual machine, you can just run natively. But the virtual machine captures the trace, captures the thing that's happening in the program, and then can replicate it on chain. And so this setup, allows you to prepare pre-images quickly, but also to proof every single instruction and to modularize it in such a way where you don't depend on Canon only. You can have a different virtual machine in between these two program layers, or you can have a different program and still use Canon. It's a very simple protocol. There are hints and there are keys and values. The hints allow you to signal what you're trying to do so it might be, oh, I'm touching this uh, layer one block. I need the transactions of all of it. I need the receipts. Then the server can prepare it. Regular RPC call to get the data. And then convert it into these pre-images, which also include the intermediate nodes and like the, the, the data you might otherwise not think of, but are, is part of the Ethereum protocol to merkleize and construct the data that the, the, the chain transitions over to authenticate all the, all the contents. And so the fault proof VM is about execution proofing. We try to make the pre VM very, very simple. So it's very bare metal. There's no kernel, no hypervisor, no IO. All these things add complexity. And it's complexity we do not need to replicate the state transition. We just need synchronous execution with very basic memory, very basic environment interactions. And so this is what we're trying to prove, to go from one thread context to the next thread context. And you can think of like a, a simple instruction storing a, a single word that touches the registers, the program counter, makes a slight modification to memory. And this is not difficult to replicate. And then, well, repeat it a billion times, right? Like the programs, are running at like a few gigahertz. 
Like there is a lot of stuff happening in under the hood. People don't think about computers this way all the time, but this is the complexity we do have to prove. So Canon is a MIPS fault proof VM. It's big NDN, 32 bits. We run a single thread context. And so this means that for Golang, you have to disable some, some parts of the runtime. You cannot have concurrency. You cannot have garbage collection. So memory will grow. But this is bounded. Like you can prove a small program at a time and then still conclude the correct outcomes. This is how you can run Canon. So you go into the Optimism Mono repo. You can take the program, build it, take Canon, build it, and then combine the two and instruct it to take some layer one um, reference data, a claim that was made on layer one about the layer two, and then you can prove OP Gertie. You can prove a real network. Now, mind you, like these virtual machines are, the execution is complete, but the on-chain part is still in development. Now, we have alternative to Canon in development. This is kind of a side project where we can do RISC-V instead of MIPS and change a bunch of other things about the virtual machine. And this, this creates this diversity while still being conformant with the specifications. And so the same Go program that we used with Canon, we can also use with the RISC-V uh, version. And this one is even maybe more minimal in a way, where we, don't we do not strictly need floating point operations. Ethereum doesn't know floating points. Um, Go runtime barely uses them. So you can do without and simplify the, the RISC-V proofing. Okay, so what is this program we've been talking about? I tried to explain the state transition concept, but really it's a layer one chain, layer two chain, new inputs, creating new outputs. And so when we bootstrap, we create the initial buffers of information, we start processing. There's this derivation pipeline, which we call it, to convert all this data into layer two blocks. And so it's not coupled one to one where you can have multiple data transactions, all contain data that's compressed together, and then efficiently basically make a lot of layer two data available in the most raw form. And then well, the program really is just pulling in components from GAF and the um, OP node to make the execution of the node stateless, to make it very simple to replicate with like a, as a pure function with an Oracle as input. So when we have one Go program, this is based on the reference stack, OP node, OP GAF. No new state logic, no changes to GAF. Like this is all reusing code, trying to be minimal with our proofing. We don't want to invent new things. We don't want to add complexity. We can have a Rust version too. And so we have Maggie, this alternative to the OP node, a layer two consensus layer client for the OP stack. We have RAF, or now in development, OP RAF, an Optimism version. And then you can combine them into an OP program. And this is a very new project. This is barely off the ground. But this expresses how we can create this diversity and have optionality in proofing. And then last but not least, we have the ZKVM ID. We do not always have to make optimistic proofs. We still believe in ZK approaches. And so we have different efforts that we support with uh, the Optimism Collective. Now, Risk Zero, are all familiar with. I'm not sure if they're talking to Yves Berlin or, sorry, the <laughs> Protocol Berg. The, they have ZEF, it's REVM based uh, Risk V ZK prover. With modifications to support the OP stack, you can have the similar ID of a program. And then with the Risk Zero proofing stack, the virtual machine, you get the same kind of composition. And we have a MIPS version too. And uh, well, that's all. Wraps up the optimistic proofing, wraps up ZK proofing. 
and uh, I hope you learned something. Do we have time for questions? Two questions. Two questions. Yeah, um, something I've heard in the Arbitrum space is that they uh, have implemented fraud proofs, unlike Optimism, which doesn't have fraud proofs. So I was just wondering what exactly they mean when they say that. Well, so my interpretation is that both protocols have an implementation of the virtual machine. We have a MIPS version and they have a WASM version. Then both protocols have an implementation of bisection. Um, and then the one of Arbitrum is fully deployed, but then has the training wheels uh, on. And then the one of Optimism is not deployed. And in that sense, Arbitrum has them on layer one. The, well, I wouldn't necessarily call the security service that much difference, since I, I don't believe that these training wheels and a singular implementation with potential bugs and high complexity adds that much to the protocol security. But it's a, it's a step forward compared to where we are now with uh, the OP stack. So on one of your slides, you mentioned that the Asterix uh, mirrors 99% the design of uh, the Go and Yule implementation of them. What do you mean exactly by that? Right, so if you think of the VM, there's an on-chain proofing part and an off-chain proof construction part. The on-chain proof is similar to, well, it, it literally just implements a single instruction. But to prepare that instruction, you need to have performed the previous instruction. And so you also need an off-chain version of the same code. And you don't just want to run the EVM implementation through all instructions. You want to use a more like a faster, more native emulator to get to that part of the, the trace, the virtual machine execution, to then take a snapshot and create a proof of that situation. And so you require both an on-chain as well as an off-chain implementation of the instruction set. And with Canon, we have a Go implementation off-chain and a Solidity version on-chain. On -chain. With Asterisk, there is a U implementation on-chain instead. Thank you.